is up, everybody? Welcome to the Run Pure Sports NBA Hardwood Show. It's me, Mangone. It is not Bobby. It is Glock, though. He is here hanging out with us. And we are here to discuss a great NBA slate, tons of wild news. And we get to talk about the amazing Boston Celtics who can rest anyone and everyone whenever they want and still win games, Glock. So, Glock, why don't you tell me more about how great the Boston Celtics are? Oh, I mean, yeah, they're great. I would say they're considered a favorite to win the East. Uh, I won't say they're a favorite to win at all, but obviously, man, they're they're loaded, man. And I mean, you see it like coming down the stretch. Like, I guess if you're a Boston fan, it's nice to be one because, you know, every other day, one of your star players can sit, you know, Tatum can sit and then Jalen Brown can sit. We saw it last night where Tatum sat and then, you know, Jalen Brown and Derek White did all the work. Um, and now tonight, obviously, it's it's in reverse. So from a DFS perspective, you know, for us, obviously, we tr we try to identify these spots where you know, teams are shorthanded and the usage will be concentrated and, you know, you don't have to do a lot of guessing. Um, so, yeah, obviously Boston will be a popular spot tonight, but there's also other popular spots that are popping as well, um, which we'll get into. Um, but, yeah, um, excited to be on a show with you. It's, it's been a while. I know you I, I, I would say you introed us wrong because you said it's not Bobby, it's Glock. It's it's more like it's not Bobby, it's me. So I, mm -hmm. I'm I'm a regular on this show every Saturday. So so it's not Bobby, it's it's Mango. So let's get that straight. Yeah, Glock Glock is a regular for sure. Bringing you the NBA takes here. I'm the regular on the Sunday show. So uh for bringing that tomorrow. But uh here to break down this slate. Uh we also got yeah, we have tons of stuff going on. Right, we got Gonzaga's playing right now. They're my team, so they're beating Holden's Tech or Kansas Jayhawks. So, hopefully, they can get, get that victory. We got MMA tonight as well. I know uh, Glock loves himself some MMA DFS. I can't wait to hear how the refs screw up tonight's card, like they screw up every card. Um, so yeah, uh, should be a fun time. I'll be sweating the March Madness tonight and everything. And uh, hey, if you haven't gotten in on Rum Pure Sports, we still have that code of March 15 to get you 15% off your first payment. Uh, you got tons of stuff there. So also to please hit that like, that would be appreciated as well. Before we dive into these games, Glock, anything else you want to talk about? Do you want to tell me how great the UFC card is? You got some stupid UFC shirt on right now too. So it seems like you're hyper UFC. <laughs> uh, this card is pretty bad. Honestly, there's, there's a lot of close fights like pick them wise. Uh, so it's kind of tough from a DFS perspective, but you know, apart from NBA, I love watching MMA. You're right. There's every week a judge gets a, a fight completely wrong and, and it screws you over. But, you know, if, if you play MMA DFS, you love pain. And, you know, I like pain, I guess. So, so I just keep coming back to it every Saturday. <laughs> I'm just glad I finally got you to admit that uh, you're right. They always screw up a card and they always do. It's every week. It's I, I see it every single week on Twitter. I don't even have to look for it. Rock. I don't have to go out of my way and watch the card and go, how is the fight going to be screwed up? I just wait for all of you guys to tweet it out and complain. So it just is what it is. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 like atrocious sometimes, like how bad it can be. But, you know, you win some, you lose some. And, and that's that's just the way it goes sometimes. So you, you take the hits while, while you can. Yeah, the one the one that I'm referring to last week, I remember specifically I was picking up food Glock and I opened my phone and I saw one of the guys that I had. I saw he had a lot of points like he had a ton and it was climbing and climbing and I got excited. And I said, oh, I'll just I'll have the win in like two minutes. I grabbed my food. And then I, I, I go into the car, I open the app, and what happens? I see my points didn't go up, and I see final. And I was like, ah, uh, something really bad happened. And uh, yeah, it was really bad. But yeah, well, uh, let's see. Uh, do you guys have any promo codes for resubscribing? Uh, I don't think we have resubscribing ones. You can try uh, RPS 15, you can try March 15, but that's what we got right now for you. Uh, sign up, tons of good stuff going on. Uh, we got golf too i mean uh, we had a golf showdown uh show tonight so be sure to check all of that out but we're gonna dive in and talk the nba uh we got uh one thing to mention with the slate so there's one seven o'clock start and it's orlando and sacramento not the greatest game on the slate then we dive into charlotte and atlanta at that at that 7 30 eastern time and then there are four games locking at eight o'clock so You'll have plenty of opportunities to pivot, I'm pretty sure. So uh, that's an interesting aspect to this slate. We obviously won't have all the starting lineups. So that could impact some of the decisions you make early on as well. Glock, what have you seen looking at this slate? Like, that's one of my overviews when I see it. Like, this slate feels like it doesn't even really lock till 8 o'clock. Now, of course, there are games earlier, and they do matter. But I think that's a big talking point on this slate that, hey, lock isn't just at 7 and you go out to eat, right? Lock seems like it's at 8 o'clock 
Yeah, exactly. Because it all hinges on that Boston Celtics news. Um, and also Jordan Poole is questionable in, on the Washington side. So, yeah, you have one game that lost right away in, in Sacramento and in the Magic where, you know, you're not going to have much ownership on that first game at all. So obviously you could make a case for, you know, one or two contrarian plays. But like for myself, I would probably be max one at the most from from either team in that first game. And then obviously, you know, you have Atlanta, which is a big spot after in the next 30 minutes. So depending on when you get the Jordan Poole news, when you get the the Boston news, it's kind of how you're going to be dictating your lineup. So, yeah, I think the contrarian route is, is to like kind of get into that first game, which I probably won't do. But, you know, I think the real key, which we'll want to push to, you know, the viewers and the members is, is kind of wait out on the Boston news to see what happens there, as well as Jordan Poole, because, you know, if he's out like, you know, that could open up a guy like Jared Butler who, who would start, you know, in his place or. Who knows, John? Hopefully, it's not Johnny Davis, but uh, I hope it's Jared Butler in that spot, and that would make him a, a nice value play. So, uh, yeah, I think we need to wait it out tonight for sure. Yeah, no, as you're asking, if you sign up, uh, is the opto included in the membership? Uh, there is a uh, run, there's a uh, Saberson add on, so you have to add that on. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you, you go from there. So, uh, if you go to the uh, you know, pricing page on the site, you can read all the different ones and kind of figure out what works for you. Um, yes, uh, Glock, the news is key. And like, if Jason Tatum sits, that's a huge piece of news, right? Like we could not have that by the time Locke shows up. I mean, we will get an update in my opinion at six 30 Eastern, like any of these guys at eight o'clock, you will get the coach speak, the press conference, you'll get the update. Now the update could be from questionable to game time decision, but Hey, you'll get the update. And then you have to figure out what you're going to do with that. That's going to be important. Um, we do have some pieces of news in this Orlando game. Uh, I don't know if Gary Harris out is a big piece of news for news for you, Block, but hey, it is news. Um, Sacramento is a team that I think we like to target. At least I feel like they're a good team to target. Sacramento is a pretty good basketball team. I heard Kevin Garnett say on a podcast a couple months ago, uh, he basically said, Orlando ain't a free win anymore. He ain't just walking into Orlando and catching a dub and getting out of there. Like, this is going to be a dogfight. I think this game could be a better real-life basketball game than a fantasy one. We do have some interesting spend-up options. When there is value, you have to consider all of the spends. We don't have Luka on the slate lock, so you got to figure out someone else to spend on. Maybe you'll spend on Sabonis. Maybe you'll spend on Banchero. I mean, there are options here to spend on. There's not a lot of amazing value plays. Um, I think there's guys like Wendell Carter in the mid-tier that you could make a case for. Not my favorite play, but at 5'3", I just think it's a cheap price tag. You can make a case that... Franz Wagner at 6'8", I mean, it is cheap. He's been horrendous lately for what it's worth. It feels like he's doing his best Tyrese Halliburton impression, but 6'8 is a cheap price tag for the ceiling he could show. You know me too. I'm a big De'Aaron Fox guy. 9'2 is starting to get a little pricier for him, but on a slate where we need spends, I think De'Aaron Fox isn't the craziest. I think I prefer other spends later on that we'll get to, like Kyle Kuzma and other options. But Glock, break this game down because I think it's one that we want to be lower on for sure. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. Like. You know, obviously, you can always make a case for De'Aaron Fox, uh, Demonis Sabonis on the Sacramento side. You know, I tend to lean more towards Demonis Sabonis, but his price tag is getting up there. Um, Orlando has generally been pretty stout defensively. Like, I, I kind of put them, you know, they're not in the same defensive category as a Brooklyn, but like from a DFS perspective, it seems like they always minimize, you know, the fantasy output against them, right? So, like, if you consider it, playing anyone on Sacramento, I think I would definitely max one. Uh, Fox and Sabonis would be, you know, my favorites for sure. Uh, Malik Monk, we've been playing, he's been chalk like on the past few slates and now is projected for not much ownership at all. So I don't mind him, but I definitely prefer when he's playing in, in Pacific time zone because that's when he becomes the next Michael Jordan. Uh, but yeah, I think the Sacramento side, it's just Fox, Sabonis, and Monk for me, but I'm not going to prioritize them. Like I said, max one, um, if, if anything at all. And it's just to preserve my flexibility for later, right? Because we don't know if Jason Tatum is going to be in or out. And obviously, you know, Boston's already going to be missing Porzingis and Drew Holiday. Uh, so it's like, if I land on Jason Tatum, I'd probably just rather spend up for him because the, the usage is just going to be concentrated on him. And then obviously, if Jason Tatum's out, then you have the flexibility to move stuff around. So that's probably how I'm going to be planning for it. Um, and then Orlando side, you hit it on the head, Fran Franz Wagner is always can be kind of a filler play. Um, I listened to him on the on the JJ Reddick podcast, and like I really like the things that he's saying. Like he's been watching tape on, you know, uh, Luca and Jokic and see how they slow things down. 
he's trying to drive to the paint and create plays for for his teammates. And so, you know, that's that's obviously adding to his assist upside, uh, double double upside, which which we love on DraftKings. So I think Franz would be my favorite for Orlando. Um, obviously, you can always make a case for Paolo. Um, I think he recently just came off like a triple double uh, in his last game, which was his second of his career, something like that, which is obviously good. And Sacramento does pace the game up, which is nice. Um, but like you said, you know, I, I want to reserve flexibility for later in the later game. So I probably won't be too crazy on this game. Um, and then lastly, Wendell Carter Jr. Man, like that tag is awesome, I feel like. But it's just like the minutes. Like if they were playing him 30 plus minutes every game, like he would probably be really chalky on this slate, in my opinion. Um, but the fact that his minutes are not too consistent, it worries me somewhat. Um, but I think if in MME formats, I think you, you can get some exposure there because he's only 5.3K on DraftKings. And like, that's not going to restrict you too much at the, at the center position, in my opinion. So getting, getting in on a guy overweight, like 15, 20% of Wendell Carter Jr. I think he might be my favorite plan on, on this slate, like, or on this game. Um, but yeah, other guys, like, obviously you can make a case for them, but I'll be lighter in general. Yeah, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense there, Glock. Um, as I look at this slate a little deeper, right, um, one thing to note with the studs, there, there's three studs, and I feel like it's a slate where there's not a lot of studs, right? And the reason I call this out is, like, when we have value, typically, it, it's, like, whenever you can just grab Luka and Jokic and Giannis and, like, all these guys that are in the 12K, it's a different slate than when, like, there's only two guys above 10K. Um, keep in mind, Sabonis at 10.9, Wemby at 10.6. Also, if we get more value that opens up, which if Horford and Jason Tatum sat, let's say both sit clock, that's going to open up some more opportunities for some Boston centers where we might not need to spend for centers. Then you lose Tatum. What I'm getting is there are not a lot of studs on this slate. It's more like that, like tier two. Um, yes, Wemby and Sabonis are above 10K. I think my favorite studs right now are Wemby, Tatum, and Murray. No particular order, but those are my three favorites that I would be keying on. If I was building three teams and I could only spend on one stud, which I think you'd spend on two studs on this slate if you want, but if I was only spending on one, that's how I would allocate my teams. I'd have Murray, Tatum, and Wemby mixed as the three favorite studs. Um, I think for this game, though, Sabonis, again, I like Wemby just way more. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Nothing against uh, Sabonis, but just it is what it is. Um, and then for I like Wemby. Too cheaper too yeah for 300 less and i already said i'm every single slate i'm just being overweight on wendy i don't care and uh i'm just going to be overweight the rest of the season and i'll figure it out that's my plan going forward so i will be more overweight on wendy dance bonus in my mme stuff and yeah we definitely agree on the wendell carter jr thing for sure and uh yeah i know franz wagner's studying film clock i study luca and i don't get better at basketball so i don't know what his problem is he sucks right now i mean he really is just bad it's We'll see though. He's a flow chart play. I will call that out if, if anyone cares. He's on the flow chart. Uh, at 6'8, I think there is a ceiling there, but I'm going to be careful with these guys. I don't want to be too overweight because I want to be able to pivot, right? If Tatum's out, I want this flexibility. So I want to be underweight on that game. Uh, let's go to Charlotte and Atlanta and talk about this one. Clearly a really good game. Uh, Charlotte is one of those teams we always want to attack. It's just, it's in the conversation every single day. Hey, Charlotte's on the slate. We attacked it. So we're going to attack him with Dejounte Murray as a spin. I already talked about liking him. He's definitely one of these spins I like on this slate. I'm not sold on Bogdanovich. I've been saying when he is at this price, he always garners ownership. Um, I'm not saying he's a bad play. He's going to pop in projections. What I'm saying is I think for his ownership, he's a bad play. Like I think he is not worth it. I think he is going to gain too much traction where I would rather be underweight on him today. I think that makes sense. There's other plays I'd rather get to. Um, if he somehow is going to be lower owned, then you can make a case. But I just think at that price, he has not been paying that tag. Now, the Charlotte matchup is an interesting one. I will give credit there, but I'm not excited about that. We can attack Charlotte with big men. Clint Capella in limited minutes has paid off that tag of 6'4", but to be fair, he's got to do a lot at 6'4 right now. I'm not super excited for Capella. I understand him as a play, but not someone I'm dying to get to. DeAndre Hunter, um, the minutes ceiling, it's it's gotten higher. You do have to worry about the floor, though. He's someone else I'm a little cautious with, for sure. Akungu is doubtful. If Akungu played, that would nuke a lot of these other plays, but seems like he's not going to play. And if he doesn't play, that's going to lead into Bruno Fernando, who has to be an intriguing play to some degree. 
And then we got Vic Kretschke. I don't know what you want to say about him. He played 38 minutes recently, got 18 DK points. I mean, this is like the uh, definition of a condom player, right? Uh, and it, it could go poorly. So for me, I'm leaning on being more underweight on some of these Atlanta options. I understand it is a good matchup, but I'm just not super excited about them. And then on the Charlotte side of the ball, I think Atlanta has been a team we've attacked. But since Trey Young has been out, I think we've had to shift our mindset a little bit. I know I have. I'm curious if you have as well. Because Miles Bridges is eight, too. I think it's fine. And on a slate where we talked about not having a lot of studs, you could get away with it. But again, a guy I think I want to be under on. I just want to be over on other studs rather than Miles Bridges. Um, Brandon Miller, 6'7". Um, he has definitely been very up and down. Do I want to embrace it in this matchup? I don't know. Maybe. I'm curious your take on that. And then there's Trey Mann, Richards, Michik. I feel like Michik is the best play if I had to pick, but I don't feel confident in him. So another game I'm thinking about it being a little bit under on, especially if I don't have all that news. How about you, though? Because I think this game is definitely one that is going to garner ownership, and I'm a little cautious with it. Yeah, I think, like, you know, you look at the Atlanta side, all of these plays are projecting for north of 15% owned, um, starting with Vit Kretschy being the lowest guy, and just because he's like a 3K starter, right? And, and going to play minutes. So you nail it on the head. Like, who knows what he does in those 30-plus minutes? Just know that the minutes will be there, and, you know, it's going to be on him to, to produce or not. Um, I think you raise like all valid question marks on all the pieces like Clint Capella. He has like a monstrous projection around the industry. It looks like with a 26 minute projection and it's like this, this guy, it's like, they're not going to play him 30 plus minutes just because like, I think he's just made of glass and, and I don't think he could play that, that many minutes without getting hurt. So it's like, obviously it's an amazing matchup. We always target bigs versus Charlotte, but can he produce in those limited minutes, um, at the ownership that he's at? I, I kind of agree with you where I would probably want to take an underway position. Uh, and then the same goes with bogey, right? He's going to be owned, obviously, guard and forward eligible on DK. So that's just going to add to his ownership. I don't feel like he's killed you at all this year. Like, if you just pull up his log, man, there's been so many times that he's chalked. But, like, he's had one 40-plus fantasy point performance in the past month, it seems like. So it's like... It doesn't feel like he can kill you. And obviously in the past years, like Bogey, it seems like he's been that guy like to really pick up the slack when like a Trey Young or DeJounte Murray has been missing. But this year, it doesn't seem to be the case. And obviously, Jalen Johnson is out of the mix, who I think has been a big contributor to, to Bogey's like kind of non-upside, I would say. But I would probably rather err on the side of caution and, you know, just focus my, my attention on DeJounte Murray, who you know, has been playing amazing since Trey Young went down. He is my favorite spend today for sure. And I don't I don't think that's like an unpopular take at all. Just because like the way the news is shaping on the slate, he's probably going to be the highest owned stud on this slate, in my opinion. Um, and then like, obviously, if Tatum is out, then that ownership shifts more onto Murray as well, based on when the news comes. And then probably if you can spend up to Wemby, then him and Wemby may be the highest owned studs. Otherwise, it'd be DeJounte and Tatum, obviously, if he's in. So, um, yeah, obviously love DeJounte Murray. And then, yeah, you see a lot of Bruno Fernando. I kind of hit on it where, you know, they're not really wanting to play Clint Capella over 30 minutes. So, you know, whether Clint plays 26 minutes, 25 minutes, you can expect this, the rest of the split to go to Bruno Fernando, who's 3.9K, forward and center eligible, um, has been a high fantasy point per minute producer in the past. So, I think I'm with you on this game where, you know, DeJounte Murray and Bruno are probably my favorite. They're obviously going to be owned, but um, I think they're the best chalk of the bunch. And then on the Charlotte side, it's just purely contrarian plays for me to try to correlate with the chalk. I think Miles Bridges is my favorite, but like you said, it's do I want to lock up 8.2K this early where, you know, I'd rather just have the flexibility with Tatum? Probably not. So my focus here is definitely more so on the Atlanta side and, I don't think that's like the contrarian take at all, but um, I think we can get different, you know, later on the slate with how the news breaks. Yeah, agree with you there, Glock. And another thing too, like let's say we don't have the news in time. If I don't have the news in time, 30 minutes before on the Jason Tatum stuff, well, what if Luke Cornett opens up at 5K or Xavier Tillman at 3K and, and Horford's out as well? Like, I just think if the news doesn't hit, these Atlanta plays are not going to be as good as some of these other plays, especially if it falls that way. And there's still enough value where I can still make things work, right? There aren't bad plays in this next coming up game. So I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, 
I do have an interesting question in the chat because I'm curious your take on it. Um, one seat in the FanDuel final today. I know JVC is there and Brennan third and Schlong, so good luck to them. Maybe Fallick is there too. Good luck to those guys that got in, but it's a no late swap plate. So let's say, and I know all of you guys watching don't have this situation, but it's a fun scenario to play out. Would you play it safe with the early game starters or take with Tatum? For me, I if I did not know the Tatum news, I would still play Derek White personally. Like I'm fine with him. I would not play Tatum in this spot. I would play Pritchard. I, I'd be okay with playing Pritchard and White. I would not play Tatum. I think you're the same. Like, why waste the zero, especially with a stud? You're not going to recover from that. And I know we talked about how there's, like, limited studs, but, like, I'd much rather take a chance on Fox, Murray, or, like, I'd make, like, a Wemby and Murray build instead, right? I'd probably play those two and then fill out maybe values from there. I still think if Tatum's in, I think Pritchard is a good play. I know we're not on this game, but I think it's a very interesting conversation, Glock. So how would you handle yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously when I qualified for my first live final, I, I DM'd you and like asked for you advice, you know, like, man, should I play this lineup or, or what? And then you you responded back to me and was like, you know, just play a lineup that you won't regret at the end of the day and what makes you be able to go to bed at night simply. So it's like, obviously, if you have a strong lean on Jason Tatum being in or out, like lean into that okay? because obviously right now he's going to be owned, but that that's in a you know late swap scenario how so in the in the live final he's probably going to be low owned so obviously if you take that risk and he's he's in and he crushes you're going to be printing because you know he's gonna be a low owned stud however you know i like the point you made where you you're just going to play the guys that already project well and could project even better if tatum is out in a peyton pritchard Derek white like these two guys you know they're already like Tatum could easily bust even if he plays and and Pritchard and White could could crush. I mean, that's what happened last night. Jalen Brown didn't really get there. Uh, I mean, he got there, but he didn't have the flames or whatever. Um, but P Peyton Pritchard and Derek White did and, and they crushed. So like you could see the same scenario here um, where Tatum could be in, but Pritchard and White are, are the leverage off of him anyways. So um, I like the point that you made where, you know, you play the strong plays that can get even better with or without Tatum. Um, but like, you know, then then you get into the point where it's like, should I plan for like, you know, maybe Sam Hauser starts like instead of Jason Tatum. I don't know if I would go that far. I would just probably play Derek White, Peyton Pritchard. You know, DeJounte Murray's a great spend, like you mentioned. Wemby's a great spend. Uh, I, I would definitely go similar to your route for sure. Yeah, I, I do. I do always end up, uh, you know, I, I do think it was great advice I gave. Uh, I, I when when you play whatever you can go to sleep at night. Like whatever, if you go to sleep and you're going to be sick with the decision you made, like absolutely sick, that's the last thing you want to do. I even believe that on DFS slates, like tonight. Like if I did something and like, let's say I played like, I don't know, I never played, I've never played the Thunder. Let's say I played the Thunder today, something that's higher stakes than normal. If I played Jason Tatum and somehow couldn't get off him or he got like late scratch, I would just be sick, right? Now, obviously I wouldn't be sick if it was like a late scratch situation, but like just do what makes sure you'll be able to go to sleep tonight and be like, I feel confident in the way I played. You understand the risks that you are getting into. Come up with this decision at 5.10 Eastern, right? Or whatever time, two hours before. Do not put yourself in a situation where you're coming up with this, with this decision at like 6.59, one minute before, and then you make a decision that makes you sick. Try to make this decision. Am I comfortable with playing Tatum now? Yes or no. Like, try and come up with it earlier. I think that's a very helpful way to go about it. And uh, good luck there at the final. Hopefully uh, hopefully you're at the top or a Run Pure member is at the top uh, with the logo there. Hopefully uh, JBC and them and, and Bryce and one of those guys can get up there too. But uh, we'll obviously talk about this Boston game. It's such an interesting talking point for sure. I think we touched on Charlotte and Atlanta pretty good. Um, let's go to Toronto and Washington first. Maybe we can stall a little bit to see if we get that Boston update because they've been pretty good about giving news updates on like some of these studs. But Toronto and Washington Glock, um, I have definitely been on the record saying I have not been a fan of Toronto slates lately. They are not my favorite slates. I, I am not uh, sitting there excited to play them. Um, at least they priced them up a little bit more. Um, they are playing the Washington matchup. I'm curious to see how you're handling this spot. Gary Trent Jr. is in. We got Kelly Olynyk, Bruce Brown. Grady Dick and Oche Akbaji. I'm assuming those five are the starters. I assume they'll put Bruce Brown at the one as the starting point guard. Could they go a Javon Freeman Liberty again? 
yes, I think they could. And then they'd maybe bench either Grady Dick, Brown, or maybe they'd bench an Akbaji. But we'll see. I'm curious what they decide to do here. Um, regardless, I think you can't avoid Toronto on this slate. Now, can you get away with not playing some of these guys? Yes, I think you can get away with not playing a Kelly Olinick. Like, for instance, Kelly Olinick only played 27 minutes the last game. If this game is not close, well, then you might not get the full run. Problem is, he is playing Washington. We expect this game to be more competitive than past Raptors games. This is a spot where I don't think, like I kind of mentioned on the last slate on the Up the Lock show, how I thought Bruce Brown, Kelly Olynyk, like some of the expensive guys, they were guys to go more underweight on. They were guys to be more cautious with. And then kind of push on these cheaper guys a little bit more. I thought that made a lot more sense. I don't feel that way on this slate. It's hard to ignore Kelly Olenek at 6'8". I think he's a good play. I think there are routes where it goes wrong, but these are better spots for these 6K and above guys in Brown Jr., Gary Trent Jr., and Kelly Olenek. To be fair, they have to do more to pay off those tags right now, but overall, these Toronto Raptors guys are really good plays. Um, I'm curious how you break it all down because it's going to be tough. Um, let's just touch on Toronto as a whole by itself, and then we'll go to Washington just because it's really hard – to break this down, I think starting lineups are going to be important. Jonte Porter is already out. How do you see it, though, Glock? Because I don't think we can ignore Toronto. I think the Boston value is better than Toronto, but maybe you have a different take on it. No, I agree with you. And, yeah, I think your starters are probably correct with those five. And, obviously, the reason why Toronto is popping is, like, they won't have R.J. Barrett, they won't have Jonte Porter, and no Emmanuel quickly. Um, now, Gary Trent was questionable like on, on last night's report and now he's obviously probable. So obviously I expect him to start. Um, but yeah, it's tough because last night, obviously they were on the slate against OKC. I played it similarly to you where, you know, Kelly Olenek was projected chalk. Bruce Brown was projected chalk, like hitting every team. Um, and it was against OKC with like a 10 plus spread. And in my head, I'm just like, you know, I'm planning for blowout. I'm going to play the cheapies like Javon Freeman Liberty. Obviously he got the start then and was a strong value play. Uh, Jameis Ramsey, and then Jordan Nora were kind of guys that I focused in on. Obviously, it was Grady Dick was was smashing to, to start the game. And it, it kind of got scary because I felt like OKC wasn't going to pull away. And, you know, towards the end, they, they finally did. And guys like Bruce Brown didn't get there. So um, it definitely depends how you script this game out. Um, you mentioned it like against Washington. I would expect this one to stay a lot closer than last night. So it does bring into play more guys like Kelly Olenek, Bruce Brown, Gary Trent Jr., um, I think those three would be my favorite, but I will say like 6.3 K on DK for Gary Trent, like for a guy that's super, super shot dependent, obviously he's going to get the shots up, but like, does he really rack up rebounds and assists? No. So he's going to have to get the raw points to get there. Um, so he's probably my least favorite of the three. And then similarly to Bruce Brown, man, he's popping a ton guard and forward eligible, but he's 6.1 K man. And it's like the similarly to Bogdan Bogdanovich. I feel like, he hasn't really killed you by fading him this year. Obviously, you know, he used to be priced in the 4Ks coming off the bench, right? So he has like a, you know, 35 fantasy point game at 5K, but now he's 6K. And granted, it's a great matchup, but he's going to need a lot to kill you. And obviously, Bruce Brown has the triple-double upside, um, but he's a guy that I kind of want to be cautious on. I think my favorite is Kelly Olenek, um, just at the, the tag and the upside that he can bring. Um, I know he's not like a traditional big, but this Washington, you know, front court is not too big. Obviously, they get Marvin Bagley back, but um, Kelly Olynyk's the guy that can stuff the stat sheet and probably the guy that I like the most from Toronto. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I think the main dudes are going to be more so in play tonight than last night for me. I would rank it Kelly Olynyk, Bruce Brown and Gary Trent Jr. Um, and then probably I'm not going to chase the Baji game from yesterday. Same with Grady Dick. I think he has like one good game in every seven. So um, just more just on the main three Toronto dudes for me. Yeah. Uh, real quick, Amphor, letting everyone know Gonzaga is smashing Kansas. You love to see it. I'm pretty hyped about it. DFS plays are doing good too, so happy about that. But, um, yeah, let's uh, let's shift on over uh, and talk about Washington a little bit. Uh, if you guys have Toronto questions, let us know. I think it's tough to like really decipher between them all. I just be cautious with the 6K guys. That's kind of how – my take on it. I want to see what starters are going to be. Um, for me, if I Baji started, I'm going to absolutely love him. Uh, be careful with Jordan Noir unless he's starting. They could easily not play him as much. Um, I, I like Grady Dick the most, I think. I think he feels kind of the safest. Like, I think he'll play in blowout. I think he'll play if the game is competitive. 
kind of seems like that guy for me. Um, and if like any of these guys like Ramsey or Freeman Liberty randomly start, you'll obviously want to shove on them a little bit, but let's go over to Washington. Um, Washington is definitely a team that I don't think you can completely ignore. We have Jordan Poole as questionable. Um, they're healthier than they were, right? Marvin Bagley is back there at five, nine. We know he's a good fantasy producer. Um, it's not the same situation with Washington, but I still think I like Denny Avia and Kyle Kuzma as spend up options. Like I think these guys are still good plays, have really nice ceilings, should be in a competitive game. So I like the two of them. They're in the conversation for me. Corey Kispert's fine. Uh, feels like the old condom play as people call it, right? Uh, at five, four. Um, and then when it comes to all these other options, like the Champagne, the Butlers, the Baldwins, I mean, when they were just completely shorthanded, these guys were great plays. And then you saw when they started getting healthier, you didn't know who was going to be in the game. It was just uh, just a whole hop podge of who knows who's going to be in there. Just uh, throw this guy in, throw this guy in. It's just all over the place. So I think you stay away from those guys. I think you want to keep it tight with Kuzma and Denny as really good studs. And the rest of them, I want to be under on Corey Kispert with him being chalky. I think he's in tournaments. I think he's a good play to be more under on. I get it in cash games. It's fine. But I'm going to be under on a lot of these Washington guys besides Denny and Kuzma. Those are two guys I hope to get overweight on. How about you, Glock? Because I think Washington is definitely a, a, a team that's important on this slate because I think they're going to get over owned like some of these other plays we've talked about. Yeah. I need to bring up what Michael Knack in the chat said first. Bruce Brown doesn't have triple up, double upside. Let's go to the Denver game back in January when he started against his old squad. 18 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists. Was only 4 assists away from a triple-double. So I would say that's triple-double up, triple double upside, sir. Um, obviously, you know, and it's a, it's a bad Washington team. I'm going to stand on that. I, I think he has triple-double upside. But yeah, on the Washington side, I think, you're, I think you nailed on the head. Like, Denny and Kuzma are definitely my favorite. And we kind of touched on it earlier, right? When we we're talking about the no late swap situation where we like Pritchard and White, like Jordan Poole is a, is a Q tag here. So like, let's say you're planning for Washington news to fall your way here. And if you play Danny or Kyle Kuzma, obviously they, they project well already and their projections can only get better if Jordan Poole misses. So those are two guys that would clearly benefit in Jordan Poole's absence. And obviously, you know, it depends when the news comes, but we don't know who would start for Jordan Poole if he was out. Um, they've started Johnny Davis in recent in recent history, and I, I would definitely fade him if it's him this time around. But a guy like Jared Butler, 4.6K, I know it's not a 3K price tag, but he's shown upside when, when he gets the minutes. So I would like Jared Butler too if he gets a start over Poole. Um, but yeah, I think my focus is similarly to you where Kyle Kuzma and Denny Avija would be my favorite. Corey Kispert's like the white Gary Trent where, you know, he's going to, he's going to depend on the three ball, man. And if it falls, obviously it looks great, but if not, that floor is really, really shaky. So um, I prefer to be under as well. Um, and then one thing, like I was kind of curious your take on like Marvin Bagley isn't projected high across the industry for, you know, whatever reason, I didn't see any coach speak on whether he'd be limited minutes wise or not, but you know, generally the night before I write the playbook, you know, I, I kind of write like a summary of each game and try to identify like what plays will be will be strong just to reduce the amount of work I have the, on the day of. And in my head, I was like, Marvin Bagley might be a, a pretty good play today. You know, a 5.9K coming off uh, his injury. You know, they really have Rashawn Holmes behind him. But when Marvin Bagley was healthy, he was playing the bulk of the minutes. So uh, kind of curious your take on him. Obviously, he projects for like no ownership. He projects really badly across the industry. Um, but that 5.9K tag, is interesting, obviously, if we get news that he's not going to be limited or in any way. Yeah, I, I was going to touch on him. Um, I was going to touch on him a little bit. Real quick, though, Nick, uh, there's no there's no late swap. Uh, I mean, there is late swap tonight. We were talking about the live final. So if there's late swap. Don't worry. We were talking about the live final when we touched on that for a little bit. So uh, it's normal night. Um, uh, uh, so Bagley's a guy that when I'm in a meeting tonight, I kind of hope to get like five to 7% or like, I, I want to see him popping up right now. I don't want to see like 30 or 40, uh, but I want to see a small bit just because I know what the upside is. If the ceiling game is there, this isn't a matchup where I think they're going to get blown out where I think it's going to be more of a competitive game and he could do well here for sure. So I'm hoping to get a little splash of him now in like single entry three max stuff. Am I racing to put him in? Probably not. I think he could get there, but it, there's definitely risk to the play. I, I think you have to understand the risk that you're getting into. Also, 
I could see the minutes split up 20, 20 to 24, like from both Holmes and uh, whatever his name is. Uh, Bagley. <laughs> Bagley. And also, I could see small ball lineups where Kyle Kuzma was playing the five at times, right? Um, so I'm not, again, I want maybe a small ownership on it. Um, I don't want to be very overweight on a Marvin Bagley. That would be one of my concerns for sure. I could see how it can get there. Um, but I know it's like not the greatest take for sure that I'm giving, but it's trying to explain the volatility in the play. And it just depends on how much risk you're willing to take. That makes sense. Obviously he has to start and I yeah. wouldn't be shocked if they started Kyle Kuzma at the five. I mean, Kelly Olenek on the opposite side at the five is nothing to be, you know, too, too afraid of when it comes to, you know, size and strength and bully ball down low. So the Wiz could easily go small, similarly to how the Raptors do it with Kyle Kuzma at the five. And I wouldn't be shocked. So obviously that'd be also, if pools in, right. If pools in that can make them go more that Kuzma at the five than not. Right. So I think that's a big piece of news too, to help with that center decision. If that makes sense. Yep. Totally agree. All right, cool. Um, I don't got too much else to say. Uh, here's one question I'll ask you a lot. Uh, would you play Denny and Kuzma together? It's a great question because I had a team the other night that had Kuzma and Denny together. Um, I was well overweight on Kuzma. It felt great, but I had some paired with Denny. It was on Fandle, so it's a little bit different than DK, but I'd be curious your take because that's one I've been kind of mulling over lately. I don't think I would, personally. Um, I think, you know, for them to each hit their ultimate upside, I feel like they kind of do the same thing, right? Like, you know... Michael Knack is like, you know, says that I'm a troll for saying triple double upside. But Kyle Kuzma, when he was starting at the five, he was teasing triple double upside at s certain points. Right. And obviously, you know, if he's going to hit that, it takes away from Denny because Denny does a little bit of everything as well. Right. Denny's not going to score 50 raw on you. He's going to get you like 15 to 20 points, dish, dish out a few dimes and, and get some rebounds. So I think Kuzma does the exact same thing. So I would probably max one um, of those two. But you know, obviously, if it's like a last in spot where you can only afford Denny and he's just staring at you and you already have Kuzma, I don't mind it like in a single entry build. But I think in large field formats, like for them to truly hit their ultimate upside, I think you probably have to play them, you know, separate. If you do play both, you probably need Raptors ran back for sure. Um, and I think I'm going to set the rule as long as uh, Jordan pulls in. If Jordan pulls out, and especially get that five go. build too, then yeah. that would change things for sure. So, yeah. Um, but all right, that's enough for that game. Let's go to Phoenix and the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, we can talk about the Spurs first. Uh, Wemby is clearly a guy I'm going to be overweight on. I am going to go well overweight on him. I'm going to make sure to up his projection. I basically, whatever his projection is, every slate, I improve it by two every single slate. I at least two, and I just keep going. Two. That's one stock. I mean, the dude gets five stocks a game easily. <laughs> I do at least two. I, I see what happens after the two, and I look at the ownership and see how much I have, but uh, it's always at least the two. Uh, but he already projects well, at least right now, I'd say that. Now, when it comes to the rest of these guys on this on the Spurs, Devin Vassell, 7-4, I still think he's in play. Not as good as he was at that 6-7, six, 6-8 six, tag, but I still think he's in play. You can play him, especially on a slate we've talked about. There's not all these amazing studs to play, and we could lose studs, too, based on some value. Trey Jones is 6K. I still think you can get away with it at 6K. I'm curious if you think you can do that at 6K. I still think you can, though. Jeremy Sokan at 5-9, he's fine. Kelton Johnson at 5-7, he's fine. The only thing is I will likely set a rule a max of either three or two of the Spurs. And I am considering the two just because I I do think some of these guys' tags are getting a little bit up there. I think three is a little great, especially in the Phoenix matchup. Um, so, Glock, talk about the Spurs and then talk about your favorite player, Devin Booker. I know you want to touch on him. He's one of your favorite guys, and he's below 9K, Glock. So how can you not play Devin Booker, your favorite for that. player, at 8.9K? <laughs> no, I mean, I think this game is pretty simple. I think, like, it's for me, it's like a studs stud spot where if you're trying to differentiate from a Tatum or a DeJounte Murray, then you play a guy like Devin Booker um, or Kevin Durant. Obviously, um, Victor Wembanyama is coming off a of back to back. So that does kind of worry me somewhat, but it really feels like pop is just letting him go. And, you know, the, the one thing I will say about Wemby is like his rotation is is really good, despite what the what the score of the game is, because he will check in at the end of the third, near the end of the third, and play the beginning of the fourth. So it doesn't matter 
if the Spurs are down 20 or 30, he'll get that second to last rotation no matter what. And then depending on whether the game or not is close, then he'll check in for the last like five minutes or so. So I think from a rotation standpoint, Victor, like Wemby makes a lot of sense because, you know, man, anytime he's out there, like it seems every night that that he plays, you see a, a sequence where he'll get a block, he'll get the rebound, and then he'll pass it up to like Devin Vassell or Trey Jones. And he's running down the court and he catches an alley-oop lob. Like how many fantasy points is that in one possession? And like Wemby can do that, you know, tenfold. So his his upside is insane. I, I like how you said about like bumping up his rejection because, you know, right now I'm seeing him under five percent owned, which is like insane no to me. Way. Just That's just make it just makes him like a great tournament play no matter what because I don't think his ownership will get like out of control. I think like a lot of the stud ownership is going to be on Dejounte and Tatum. Um, obviously, if Tatum is out, then you could see that ownership get inflated a little more. But him being center only could constrict things a little bit which is which is interesting to me so um yeah i think Wemby for me is probably my only consideration on the san antonio side and then the phoenix side you know devin booker kevin durant Yusuf nurkic i think those are the three guys i want to hone in on um i would rank it in that order actually even though i'm not a devin booker guy i just think that 8.9k tag against a really bad san antonio defense is, is something that you know i like um and then yeah no interest on the secondary guys i think trey jones He's been playing better. Uh, he kind of had a stinker last game, but um, I think you make a case for him, like you said, a 6K. Um, but I think like a guy like Peyton Pritchard, Derek White, those guards are, are guys that I'll be honing more in on rather than a point guard only Trey Jones. Um, so yeah, just the studs for me in this game, really. Yeah. The other thing I might do with the max to a Spurs, I want to make sure I don't like hurt myself with my Wemby exposure from that, but um, I might even bump down some of the guys to make sure I get more Wemby. Wemby's just the guy that I want to make sure I get him. And I don't want to play three Spurs. I think that's wrong on this slate. Um, on the Phoenix side of the ball, um, Devin Booker, 8.9K. I mean, the upside's there. He's playing the Spurs. Kevin Durant, 3 not, or 9 3. Just think all these guys are in play. Like, you, you kind of mix and match these studs, you call it a day. You don't want to play any of these really Phoenix values. Like, I'm not playing Royce O'Neal and all these other guys. It doesn't seem like a good spot for them. So I'll be out on them. Let's go to the game that matters the most. Actually, we're going to skip the Boston game. The reason why is uh, we're going to get an update here soon. We're going to get the press conference on the Jason Tatum stuff, I think. Actually, no, we're not. We're not going to get that. But So let's just go right to Boston. I'm thinking it's 630 Eastern, not 530 Eastern. So let's go right to Boston, Glock. Um, Jason Tatum, 9.9K. The best stud, I'd say, on the slate if he plays. That's if he plays. We don't know. At least that's my thought on it. Um. Derek White at 7.6. I think he is way too underpriced. I will be bumping his projection on this slate. Peyton Pritchard at 5.3. I think he's underpriced. He might be a lock for me. Um, I'm definitely bumping him, but he might even be a lock. Um, it's hard to get away from these plays, especially if you now Horford sits. Then Luke Cornett's going to be in play. I'm curious what you think of the 5K price tag. I know we talked about that in Discord the other day about playing Luke Cornett at 5K possibly. But it's clear as day you want to play these Celtics. So here's one other question I'll ask with Boston. Do you set a max of three or are you okay playing four on this slate? And who are your favorites in this game? Uh, I think in small in single entry, small field, you can get away with four. Um, especially if Tatum is out. Now I think like if you play Tatum, Derek White and Peyton Pritchard, it gets a little thin when it comes to, you know, your expectation that all three can crush. Um, so it really depends on Jason Tatum's, you know, Jason Tatum status. And I think I'm with you, man. Like Peyton Pritchard, I think is the best play from Boston for sure. The dude has just been crushing playing North of 30 minutes easily on a night to night basis when, you know, they've been alternating rest between their guys and like the ownership on him. Like I'm seeing like 20%. There's no way. Like he's got to be North of 50 in at least single entry stuff. But if that ownership holds where he's in the 20% range, like he's got to be one of the best plays on the slate. Um, Jason Tatum versus Derek white. Man, Derek White has just been playing so, so good. And it just feels like he does a little bit of everything for sure, right? Like he'll score, he'll rebound, he'll assist. Obviously, with Tatum, you know the raw points will be there. However, you know, will he get you the assist? Will he get you the rebounds? And he's 2.3K more expensive. So I think Peyton Pritchard and Derek White are my two favorites in this game. And I haven't looked at like any of my lineups that I've generated. I, I kind of just looked at the exposures. I didn't look at them individually, but... You know, playing like fading Tatum, playing a Derek White, Pritchard, 
getting into DeJounte and maybe if like value opens up to where you could play Wemby over Tatum is, is definitely something that I will consider. I mean, that sounds amazing to me if I can, if I can make it fit. Um, I don't know if it can, but um, that's definitely something I'll consider. So yeah, I mean, I think those two are my favorite, Richard White and then Tatum. And then obviously we saw last night, Xavier Tillman got the spot start. Um, I'm, I'm glad I didn't fall into that trap. I almost did. I, I pivoted to James Wiseman last minute, which obviously ended well. Um, but we'll need to keep an eye on this lineup because, you know, what if they do start Tillman again? I think I would fade him in that, in that aspect, but if they start a guy like Luke Cornett, um, I mean, I know he is 5k, but I, I, he didn't hurt you last late when he was 5k. And I do think they will need size in the Chicago matchup. You know, they, Chicago has been wanting to play Drummond and Vucevic a little bit more together. So having that overlap might bring in more lineups where it's going to be Al Horford and another big out there on the court. So um, obviously I like the guards from Boston. Obviously I like Jason Tatum, but I would say we need to keep an eye on that starting lineup because we don't know, you know, what, what that fourth or fifth starter may be. So just keep an eye on that. Obviously we'll be in discord updating um, and letting you guys know who our favorite plays are. Yeah, uh, we haven't talked about Al Horford in that rant. Um, not saying we should play him. I'm just saying if Tatum's out and Horford's in, or even if Tatum's in and Horford, and you talk about the big man lineups, do you think I, – I think Al Horford gets completely overlooked at 6'3". Shouldn't we consider him in tournaments? Oh, man. You know my take on him. I know. Um, and he's 6'3". He's 6'3". <laughs> Mr. Chocolate Milk himself. Um, I – I would, I would fade him, man. I mean, I think I've watched enough. It's it's Chicago, right? So obviously, he could crush. But I've watched. I feel like I've watched enough Celtics games where, man, dude, the dude stands in the corner, man. I feel like he stands in the corner, watch Jason Tatum cook. He watched Jalen Brown cook. Obviously, he's gonna have to watch Peyton Pritchard and Derek White cook. So the question is, like, is he gonna knock down his open threes? Is he gonna get the stocks? And he's gonna get ten rebounds for you. So. Honestly, I hope he's out so I can just lock Luke Cornett um, and because he'll be the starter at center most likely. So that's my take. I would probably be under on Horford, but I'm always under on Horford. So that's kind of my take. Yeah, if Horford is, if he's if he's on the slate and he's single digits, I'm going to try to get over it. I think that, that'll, that'll happen. Uh, we'll, we'll see, though. Uh, I haven't ran everything. And I think news is going to just shift things so many different ways, so it's hard to know, but that's kind of my thought process on it. Not a single entry play, not a three max play, but for MME stuff for sure. Um, yeah. So Boston, obviously great plays. We just don't know who is in and out. Um, I don't know what to do with Chicago. Um, Kobe white is probable. Kobe white is 7.2 K. This is his first game back. Caruso's at five, eight. DeSumo's at six, nine. You can argue these guys are just overpriced now. Um, and even with the, the, now the emergence of Kobe white back in the lineup, I could hurt Andre Drummond at four or five, right? And some of these other guys. I mean, the Bulls, they feel like a full fate. Um, I think you could get away with playing DeRozan or Vucevic, like, but I might set a max of one Chicago. That's how much I don't want to play these guys. What about you, Bob? Oh, agree with you totally. I know <laughs> it feels like we're hand on hand and, and it feels good because you know we're not on these shows together often. So so it feels nice when like you're literally like reiterating my thoughts in my head. On the playbook, I literally wrote max one Chicago, if anything. And generally you know, some people don't believe in correlation in, in NBA DFS. I do personally. And one point we always try to hammer in RPS, or at least I do personally, is like correlating with the chalk. And obviously here we have a lot of Boston chalk. What whether it Tatum is in or out, whether Al Horford is in or out, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of ownership on these Boston players. And so obviously for them to hit their ultimate upside, you know, you expect a close game, right? And if it's a close game, someone from Chicago in theory should be um you know producing fantasy wise and like generally so that's why i try to correlate however you know you mentioned it kobe white is back in the mix it was weird last game because he came off the bench um so that makes me like the spot like even even less um who knows maybe he gets to start this game but if not like i i probably just want to stay away um if you really want to play Chicago piece, I think Vooch and DeMar DeRozan would be my favorites by far. Just know that like these dudes are probably going to be under 10% owned and you know, it's definitely contrarian. So um, I'm definitely max one, if anything, and probably on my single entry main team, I, I won't get to Chicago myself. 
All right, let's uh, let's head on over to the last game, Utah and Houston. We got nine minutes left, so if you guys could please hit that like, tap the like, subscribe to the channel. That'll let you guys know when we go live with all of our shows over here at Run Pure Sports. So be sure to get in there. Um, but let's talk about this game. Uh, Glock, Utah is another one of those teams. Every single time I say – Utah's on the slate, so we have to like the other side, right? Like, we can't not ignore it. We can't cross it off. Um, so let's start with Houston. Uh, can Jalen Green keep getting away with this crap, man? He's 8.5K. He's been chucking the ball up a ton. Um, I, I just think can't get there. I know Fred Van Vliet I feel a lot more comfortable with, but I'll admit he feels like a condom play and feels like he's not even going to get there anyways. He's been really frustrating. Utah is a great matchup for guards. So Jalen Green and Fred Van Vliet, I think they both have to be in the conversation. But when I look at them, I do worry about the price tag just being too much. Um, Jabari Smith at 7K. I mean, the price is up. Schengen was out like two weeks ago. These prices are starting to get up there. The one guy, and it doesn't feel like his price is too high yet, is Amen Thompson. I think it's a great spot for Amen Thompson. I feel most comfortable with him. Um, Jock Landell has been an absolute monster and been like, He's had slate winning upside, and at 4.7K, the production he's doing is slate winning upside. And then Dylan Brooks, he was uh, back to playing like he was playing in Canada. Um, 4.5K, and then he got ejected. Um, I think Dylan Brooks, I think Dylan Brooks and Eamon Thompson are like the two best plays on the Houston side of the ball, as crazy as it sounds. I feel most comfortable with Eamon Thompson. He is also guard and forward eligible, which is nice. There's just a lot of plays on Houston you have to consider. I am more cautious with Fred Van Vliet and Jalen Green. I just prefer other studs. So that's kind of my take on those guys. Utah, um, they can't get completely ignored on this slate. Um, John Collins is questionable. We'll see if he plays. He got absolutely destroyed by Ant and hasn't really played much since. Colin Sexton at 7-3. I think the ceiling is there. But honestly, I'm just going to be cautious with these Utah guys in general. I might even set a max of one of the Utah guys. I might make it two. But um, – I'm very nervous about those guys, for sure. And P. Lally asked what happened to me and Dylan Brooks. Uh, P. Lally, it just, you know, the price is too damn cheap, man. It's just too cheap, and it's a matchup against Utah. I can't ignore it. But, uh, Glock, do you have any Dylan Brooks love on this slate like I do? Man, I never loved Dylan Brooks. And I think it was a slate ago where he was one of the chalkier value options. I think he was the only value option to get there. Like, there, I think, if you remember, it was the Sacramento slate where Keon Ellis was major chalk. <laughs> and then Dylan Brooks was like the only chalk value piece I got there and he smashed. And if you know me, I'm not a Dylan Brooks guy either. Like if he gets there and beats me, he he beats me. Like But there's no there's beat. no there's no Shengun where he can get these peripheral rebounds, right? It's just it's a different situation right now, for sure. I agree. I agree. And, and like, you know, if you have forty five hundred left in your DK lineup and he fits what I don't blame you. I personally would be trying to get 200 more and playing a guy like Jock Landell, who I think would benefit a lot in this matchup. Like they should need a size against Walker Kessler. Um, and he benefits in both the, the close game script. And I think he put, I, I think he would play the blowout. Um, so he may be my favorite play when it comes to price per dollar on, on from this game on the Houston side. And yeah, like right now, Fred Van Vliet, Jalen green, they're projected around the same points points for me at least what i'm seeing here they're priced similarly um it is a great matchup but i think i'm with you i i do prefer the other spends um and then probably i'll try to just get cheap exposure here like with a guy like jock landell or dylan brooks like you mentioned um Eamon thompson even as like a filler piece i don't love his minutes i, I wish he would be playing north of 30 but I do think like he can break the slate and go for like 40, 50 plus with, with the way he plays and how Atlanta like does not play defense whatsoever. Like I, the Mavs played Utah on the last slate and they broke the record or, or they got second, um, 18 dunks in a single game. Uh, and like they, like the defense for Utah was horrific. And this is when Walker Kessler started too. So Luca was just eating them alive in the pick and roll. I could see the same thing happening here where, you know, Fred Van Vliet, Jalen Green, whoever they play pick and roll with. Um, hopefully it would be Jock Lando if I played him. Like they're gonna be able to eat in 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 the paint. So I like those guys the most from Houston. And then I think Utah for me is, you know, I'm seeing ownership on Colin Sexton, seeing some on Keontae George. I think they're an easy fade. I think at least in single entry. I think at MME, obviously, if you want to get some exposure, I don't blame you, but I don't think they're in the winning business, man. Like 
I don't think it's being talked about enough either. I think like they're blatantly tanking. Like they traded away to like they traded away players that were productive for them, and like they've had one of the worst records since All Star break. And like they're giving guys looks like Johnny Juzang, <laughs> Kira Lewis Jr. is on Utah now. Uh, Lucas Amanich, like Micah Potter is is in the rotation. So over a guy like Omar Yurt Seven, so. I don't think they're in the winning business, so I'm probably just going to stay away from it. Like I see like 10 plus dudes projected for them. So um, I know it's not like a massive eight, nine gamer, but I think I think I could fade this easily and, and be OK with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I want to be lower on Utah. Utah is just frustrating. Um, I, I noticed it recently when I remember I had Chris Dunn on a slate and I had like a, a little too much exposure to Chris Dunn, like more than I was comfortable with. And then I saw the Johnny Juzangs and all these losers in and I was like, screw this, man. I'm like, I just like. One thing that's been pretty profitable for me, I'd say over the past like three weeks or so is like some of these really bad teams, like Anthony Simons every single day projects. Well, I under project him or I go lower on some of these guys that Portland all this year. Yeah. Yeah. Like some of these like expensive guys that they just project well because the rates will be good. And I think they could just get destroyed and lose minutes. I just get lower on them. So I, while other people are playing them, I'm not getting destroyed by it, right? And it's giving me more exposure to better players. I'm not going out here and guessing which Utah clown is going to be the guy. I'm just saying I know I don't trust the Utah guys that the projections trust, that they're just pounding the minutes for like it's normal starters minutes because it's not. It's just not. And not sitting here guessing it's Emir Yurt 7 that's going to be on the winner because I don't need to do that. I'm just getting overweight on some of these better plays instead. And I yeah, think that's like very helpful. And a lot of these projection systems, they use like historical data and like, you know, like obviously Colin Sexton in, you know, what would a, be a regular jazz team with Lori marketing with a Jordan Clarkson guys that can actually play like his upside would be higher because, you know, his, you know, he had more opportunity to score, more opportunity to get assists, but he's playing with dudes like Bryce Sensiball, um, <laughs> Taylor Hendricks, like guys that are not proven in the league. So the rates are not that accurate when it comes from a projection standpoint. So like there's a lot of systemic risk, I, I would say, like on the Utah side. And like there's been games where Utah has been in it and like Sexton is crushing in his run. And then all of a sudden he'll just get benched for Chris Dunn and, and not close. So it's like, do you really want to take that risk? I don't. And probably for the rest of the season, I, I won't be taking risks on, on the Utah side unless like half their team is out and they have like a six, seven man rotation. That's when I'll, I'll jump in. But you know, when they have the potential to play just so many dudes, like I just don't want to take that systemic risk really. Yeah. Look at, look at Glock systemic risk, uh, whipping out all the words, right? Now. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, that, that's a pretty good one. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically the slate. Uh, there's, there's a, Oh, this question I wanted to get to, I want to ask about this. Um, Jabari was in foul trouble, so Lando got more minutes. How many minutes do you project Lando for Glock? Um, he asked me too. I, I think one of the keys with that we were talking about with the Lando stuff is like Jabari could lose minutes to Lando if it's a blowout, right? If you are playing that script where they do well, and of course Jabari Smith could play well in the blowout, but I think that's part of the equation we're saying is, and this is what I think of when I think of DFS, I don't say, hey, I know what's going to happen. I say, how many routes and paths do they have to either failure or success and it does feel like Landell has a lot of good pass to success with the blowout being possible for to help him gain more minutes, with it being an easy matchup. So I think that's why we like Landell a little bit more. Is that kind of some of your takes too? Yeah, I would project him for 20. Like, I think he gets at least 20 minutes for sure. And he has the upside for more, like for sure. Like he could get into the 27s, the 28s, you know, based on game script, I think. And like I looked at last game, the rotation, Jabari Smith, obviously he was in foul trouble. So he checked out early in the second, checked out early in the third, but he played the entire fourth. Jock Lando played with Jabari Smith at least half of the quarter. So there was overlap there. Um, so I think, you know, if you have a safe baseline of 20, 20 minutes, I think you project a four. Um, obviously, I think he has the upside for more. And, you know, if this game script goes accordingly, to how I think it could, like you could see Jock Lando play majority of the fourth, which is obviously what you want when, when you click on a guy like him. So uh, 20 with the upside for more, for sure. For sure. We got uh, our own Kevin Fallick in the Discord chat saying he could really use some news. I I feel like Fallick is in the final. I can't remember if he got a seat, but... Uh, he is. He is for sure. He is for sure, yeah. That is why he wants the news, for sure. I guarantee it. But, Man, it's crazy because like, I don't know if 
how many RPS members are listening, but Fallick is a guy that is the ultimate backloader. Like if there's late news in the late games, he will just backload all the way. He doesn't care what plays are there early for him. So I could just, I just know this no late swap thing with all the news pending is just killing him. So Fallick, if you're watching, I love you, man. Good luck. Um, hopefully this news comes for you and, and makes it easier on your decision making. But yeah, it should be interesting to see that, see how that uh, live final unfolds for sure. Hopefully we'll be screaming Mazel Tov when Phallic ships the final tonight. We're firing um, off the GIFs, the the, the GIFs, the Phallic <laughs> GIFs. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't got too much else uh, to say here, Glock. I don't know. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on that we need to that I maybe glossed over? No, we're good, man. I think there was like a request for uh, breaking down the Denver game on Utah or on Yahoo because it's included in the slate. Uh, just load up. Just load up on Denver, man. Like. Obviously, no Jamal Murray, no Jokic. Reggie Jackson, DeAndre Jordan should start. Load up on them. Aaron Gordon, MPJ. I don't think you need to set like a max Denver pieces. I think you can really make a case for playing all the starters. But those four would be my favorite for sure. Um, and then, yeah, on the freaking, uh, what is it, Portland side, um, Scoot Henderson, my favorite play for sure. Scoot Henderson and Delano Banton. So there you go. There's freaking six plays for you from that game. Yes, and look at Fallick. Ask and he shall receive. He got some news. Sasha Vizenkov. Not the news he was hoping for, but Fallick, he got some news. So there you go. Uh, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, we get the plays of the day, Glock. I don't know. Do you and Bobby do plays of the day? I assume you guys do. I think I, I heard I heard Bobby give out a, a play. I heard Kuminga once was given out. That was my Glock, actually. So there you go. Yeah, you guys do do the yeah we give it based on the likes. I don't know where we're at here, but we have a good viewership. So, I mean, I'm cool to give one if you are. Yeah, let's, we might give the same one. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm giving out a very chalky play, but uh, oh, okay, we'll see. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, give out your play first. Let's see what happens. Uh, who's, who's Glock's play of the deck? I'm gonna go Wemby, man. Um, I think fading Tatum if he's in and playing, you know, getting onto Pritchard, White, and then spending up for Wemby instead of Tatum. I think that'll be my route tonight. Um, I know it's a scary matchup against Phoenix, but we kind of touched on Wemby's rotation where. You know, he's going to get that end of the third into the fourth run for sure. So um, just depends if he can crush in that time. So I'm going to go Wemby. Um, if he's over 20% owned in single entry, I'd be shocked. And that's with Tatum in. That's with the caveat that Tatum is in. If Tatum's out, then I'd expect his ownership to, to, to shoot up. But if you were to ask me, I think Tatum plays and Wemby will be lower owned. So that's my play of the day. Yeah, I, I agree on Wemby. You are right. We probably were going to have the same play. I'm I'm probably just giving like a super chalky play. Um, I, I'm i just playing Peyton Pritchard. Man. I'm just locking Peyton Pritchard and let, letting, letting the chips fall. Like, I don't care. I've said it the past three slates, and like, honestly, I didn't – I said basically get super overweight on him, and honestly, some of the ownership was so high I couldn't get over I don't care. I'm playing Peyton Pritchard. He's the best player on the slate. He's a good chalk. Play him. Play him and Wemby. I'm going to play Wemby. I'm going to be different that way. I'll be fine. And I'll find other ways to get different. I'm going to be under on these other plays that like I talked about in these Atlanta games, right? I'm going to be under on guys like Bogdanovich and not have as much exposure. Sure, I'll have splash up in my MME, but I'm, I'm going to get underweight on a lot of these plays that other people are getting over on. So, um, Noah, I could care less what you think. The fact that you're listening, bud. Noah Moon. You know, <laughs> Bobby's arch nemesis, Noah Moon, yeah. baby. Shout out, Noah Moon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the fact that you're watching, uh, and I, I, yeah, I'm just locked. Him. I think he's just the best play of the slate. Call it a day. Uh, I don't really care. Wemby, Wemby's one of my favorite plays too. And uh, just be, be, be careful with Atlanta guys. I think Atlanta guys are not good plays. I think it are, are, are guys to be underweight on. I think Utah. I want to set some rules. Uh, I want to set some rules on them. Maybe max of one, and then Spurs. I'm going with max of two because obviously I want a lot of Wemby, and I don't mind mixing in Vassell and Trey Jones, but. Uh, yeah, that's all I got for you if, guys. If Pritchard's 80% owned and McGone has 100%, he's over the field, baby. I'm over, over the field. field. Over the I'm, field. I'm, I'm over the field. Uh, Noah, if you're upset with me, you can find me tomorrow on the NBA show, uh, breaking it down a little bit more. But, uh, yeah, and what do you think of this one? Well, before we get out of here, answer this. Is Bruno bad chalk clock? What is your take on the Bruno stuff? Because I think he's currently chalk, but I think it could change shortly. I don't think he's horrible shock. I think he's okay. Like, I don't think, Cape I don't think they want to play Capella North of 30 minutes. So like that'll lock in Bruno's minutes, I think is the backup center. And like, I know Charlotte plays small, but 
they don't have Jalen Johnson. They don't have Sadiq Bay. Like, are they going to play DeAndre Hunter at the five? I don't think so. So I think Bruno, I, I think he's fine chalk play. I don't think he's like a smash like, like Peyton Pritchard is, but I don't think he's bad chalk like Myers is saying. Yeah, but I agree. Uh, how about Hauser? We we kind of need the Tatum news for the Hauser stuff, Charlie. Uh, it is it's kind of a tough one. Hauser, he could, not, he could not start, right? That's like the big issue. Yeah, yeah. I think right now they're like kind of projecting him to start, but I we think don't know. We don't I think, know what Missoula thinks. Like he yeah. started Z Xavier Tillman last game next to Christoph Sorzingis. so um, you, you just had to kind of be tuned in for the starting lineup there. Obviously, if Tatum is out, I think he would one hundred percent start for sure. And I think he would be a great play. <laughs> he would be mega chalk for sure. But um, I think he's he's been playing well. Like, and I don't think it would stop here against Chicago. So um, if Tatum's out, I think he's a great play. With Tatum in, he's a little bit more shaky for sure. Yeah. And Glock, Josh, this is the last thing we'll do. Josh, Josh is asking, your play of the day was Wemby, but your spin up is Murray. Maybe you read between the lines. Maybe Glock is already playing both. Is that possible, Glock? I literally said that. I was like, I want to see if I can fit Pritchard, White, Murray, and Wemby. I know value may seem a little shaky right now, but you know that bill becomes probably easy if Tatum's out. But I don't know. I mean, I said it early on the show. Like, I, I want to see how those builds look and and what the value looks like when I lock those four. It may be too thin, but um, I think if you really want to put like a sticker on it, like fading Tatum would be kind of more of my stance. Obviously, he's going to be a great play if he's in. But I'll I'll try to play Wemby. That, that's basically my point that I'm trying to get at. All right, one last thing. Who's the gold dust play of the day, Jimmy? It's Noah. Noah. Noah Moon is the gold dust play of the day. So that's going to wrap us up. Thanks a lot for joining us here on the NBA Hardwood Show. We'll be back tomorrow. So for me, and go and Glock. Good luck watching shitty UFC. See you guys later.